and we welcome you here to this Kennedy Center lecture. We're glad you found us here in the library auditorium. We're grateful for the library, uh, for their accommodations, and this beautiful space to meet and, and welcome. It's our great pleasure to welcome to campus His Excellency Jose Goni, Ambassador of Chile to the United States. Uh, we look forward to his remarks uh, to us uh, today and uh, welcome his, his visit here to campus. Um, we'd like to begin just one, with one announcement. As you probably know, this fall semester, uh, the Kennedy Center Book of the Semester will be Greg Mortensen's Three Cups of Tea. Uh, we would encourage you to pick up a copy uh, available at the bookstore and prepare for his visit. Uh, to help you do so, uh, next Wednesday at 3 o'clock in the Kennedy Center, located in the Harold R. Clark Building, we'll be holding a Book of the Semester panel discussion. Uh, we're very pleased and honored to welcome Sister Sharon Samuelson, uh, Associate Dean Spencer Magleby from the Coll College of Engineering, Professor Eric Eliason, a professor of English, and uh, Professor Joan Dixon of the Center for Economic Self-Reliance in the, in the Marriott School of Management. Uh, we, we look forward to their comments about the book to help you begin to think about the issues that Mortensen's book raises as we prepare for his visit. Uh, Greg Mortensen, as you probably know, will be speaking to us as part of the University Forum on Tuesday, October 27th in the Marriott Center, where we won't have the problem we have here of, of too few seats, and we apologize for that today. Uh, we'd like to begin today with an opening prayer, as is our custom at BYU. We've asked uh, Pablo Penilo, who is an exercise science major from Concepcion, Chile, uh, to offer the opening prayer. And then we'll turn the time over to Professor Lynn Sherman, department chair of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, who will introduce His Excellency. Pablo. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the opportunity we have to listen to the ambassador of Chile, Jose Goñi. We are also thankful for the blessing that we have to attend this university. Father, we ask for thy blessing and for thy spirit. Bless us that we may be enlightened today, that we may understand the culture of, of Chile and the things that, that we can do to help our brothers and sisters around the world. Father, we are so thankful for our prophet. President Thomas S. Monson, we ask you to please bless him, bless the missionaries and those countries that don't have the gospel at this time. And these things we pray for, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This, for me, is more than a great pleasure. 1979 to 1978 to 1980, I was a missionary in Chile in the Santiago South Mission. And it was there that I, I gained a great love for this country. And to be able to introduce the ambassador, His Excellency, is truly um, a pleasure for me. Um, most of you probably heard a little bit about the ambassador. Uh, he has served as Chile's Minister of Defense. That was from 2007 to 2009. He was an ambassador to Mexico, to Italy, to Sweden. He's been a representative on the United Nations uh, Agricultural Organization. Uh, he has also served on the United Nations World Food Program. This is a man of tremendous experience uh, worldwide. Uh, it's very, been very interesting for me to look into his life a little bit, thanks to the, the internet. Con mucho cuidado siempre, no? It was very interesting to find out that he is an avid reader. Uh, he uh, is uh, an admirer, according to one interview at least, of uh, Gonzalo Rojas, who was one of our poet in residences here at, uh, at BYU for many years before returning to Chile. Uh, Vicente Huidobro, Nicolás Guillén, and Alejo Carpentier, uh, all great uh, literary figures. If you are not familiar with them, I would suggest you do so. As I was doing this research, I found a quote, and I have loosely translated it, and he can correct me, His Excellency can correct me. But I found this very revealing about him. He said, 
I do not believe that there are models that stand at the forefront of the political and social process. There are not models, there are experiences, some of them more successful than others, but they are experiences nonetheless. And it is extraordinarily re relevant that each country, each society, develop his model based around its own history, its own culture, and its own particular structural characteristics. Each country, each society, has to develop its own identity that aims towards its objective, whether it be political transitions, economic and social development, or all of them. What we have done, and he's talking about Chile, what we have done comes from the painful experiences coming out of our military government and from our experiences with the previous democratic experiment. But it is evident that what the country has been able to construct afterward has only been possible because of the growth and maturity of those who have participated in the process, what he calls los actores. I thought this was a tremendously relevant point for him to make. This was from 2006 when he was in Mexico. I believe that we will have an, an amazing opportunity to hear from a man whose experience grows out of a, a lifetime of serving his country, being interested in the affairs of his country. Now then, for those of you who are not familiar with Chile, can I just ask how many of you have been in Chile? When I was a missionary there many years ago, a lady tried to get me to understand the beauty of Chile. And this is something that I've only spent a very short time with the ambassador, but I feel this very profoundly. She turned to me and she said, when God created the earth, he took the most beautiful things that there were on this earth and he stuck them in a little corner. And when he had finished creating the world, he called it Chile. He called that beautiful area Chile. And I think that what you'll find from my contact with, with His Excellency, you're going to feel that beauty, that strength, that, that warmth that I discovered when I was a missionary, uh, shall I admit, 30 years ago, that has stayed with me and has influenced my life for good. Mr. Ambassador, I, I turn the time over to you and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Pablo. Well, the Professor already said the main idea of my conference, so we can go directly to the questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I would like to start saying that is, I'm very delighted to be with you today. It's a very important opportunity for us as ambassadors to, to came to outside of Washington. And uh, more important is to come to these places that are normally out of our normal work. So I'm very grateful of this invitation, the, this occasion of having the, a talk with you. To talk with uh, students in general, in general is something very, very important everywhere. To talk f with a student for an ambassador is uh, particularly important. So we can share some experiences. I will be very happy. So I would time to share some ideas with you in my country or and also to draw some conclusions that can be important for other people, for other countries. Because as uh, the professor reminded me, um, I believe that uh, every country, every people has to go their own experience. They are, they are not models. They are not cases that you can just take from uh, another reality and try to put in your own reality. You are to construct from the base your own experience, 
based in your own culture, your own traditions. And concerning economic and social processes, this is uh, especially true. Let me tell you firstly where Chile is located. I understood that many of you have been already in Chile, and others are preparing themselves for going to Chile. But uh, my country is located in the very peculiar position in South America. And our position, well, it's a very long country, it's 4,000 to 1,000 kilometers long, with a, a very long cost to two. And uh, this position and our geographical um, uh, location permit us to have uh, different climates. We have almost all the climates except the tropical one. But in the north, it's a very dry climate with a very dry desert uh, where the mining sector is mainly located. So with a, it's a very important in our own economy. The center of the country, can I use this last? Yes. Yeah. And the center of the country is where the most of the population live, uh, where are the agriculture activities and in some way also uh, forest activities. And mainly the, indust the in in industrial sector is located in, no, in this uh, area. And in the south of the country, it is a climate that is very cold, raining, where we have uh, the forestry sector, and all over our coast, the, we have a very important uh, uh, fishing sector. They are the main productive activities of Chile. For giving you an idea of how long is the country, well, I put it over your map, so you can understand that it's more or less the distance between, well, the extreme, the, the east coast and the south uh, or the uh, west coast in the United States. Another way of showing our diversity is putting Chile in the other way, uh, way around. So this is our north and this is our south but it gives you an idea uh, about the, both how long is the country and how diverse the climates in my country are. Well, normally, probably you, you can read and listen on Chile as a um, su success um, story from the economic point of view. And I think that is true. Chile has had a very positive um, economic development during the last uh, 25, 20 years. Uh, we have, let me tell you first, almost 60, 17 million inhabitants with uh, the majority of the population concentrated in the urban areas. Less than 15% of the, our population is uh, rural. We have an enormous concentration in the big cities, especially in Santiago, in the center of the country, Valparaiso and Concepcion in the south. And you have, it's very important to know that Concepcion is at least for two that are sitting in this uh, uh, aula. It's the most important city in Chile. <laughs> well, anyway. This is an uh, information produced by I International Monetary Fund. And uh, it uh, shows us the um, uh, growth of the Chilean economy in the context of the world economies uh, during the period of the last uh, 19 years, 1990 and 2008. And uh, what I try to show you, that uh, as a matter of fact, we have had as average with, of course, difference between uh, different years. As an average, a growth 
uh, around 5.8% per year during the, this period. That means that we had had a very positive result and uh, Chile is considered one of the most dynamic economies uh, all over the world. You can see that the Chinese economy has been growing during the same period almost 10% a year. That is fantastic. And um, all of us hope that uh, Chinese and mainly Indian economies are going to continue in this very dynamic uh, growth because they have been acting as the motor of the world economy since uh, already many years. We also hope from a Chilean um, case to continue on with, with this uh, uh, success. I'm going to show you very quickly just some of these very famous rankings that uh, are published on, uh, in different parts of the world in order to give you the, an idea about uh, this uh, successful um, case in, uh, in Chile. When we talk about uh, economic success, we are talking on, um, on an economy that has been well uh, managed during all this period. The Chilean economy, as I mentioned, is based in uh, national resources. And um, uh, they are a very important uh, share of our GDP. But uh, probably the most intelligent thing, thing that I can tell you is that we have um, success managing uh, economy in a very wise way. And what, with wise way, way, I mean that um, we understood that we have to maintain the macroeconomic equilibrium in order to, to work in the long term. Um, and uh, all the so, so sectors will uh, benefit of this uh, growth. We have, that means that we have to keep the balance in the fiscal accounts, and uh, we have to keep the, the control of the inflation rate that has been very low during the last uh, period, and we have to keep political stability. All these uh, factors, um, plus solid institutions, um, serious um, legal framework, uh, are the main economic explanation to the uh, success story of Chile. One specific secret of our own process has been the openness of our economy. Since the, the 80s, but mainly during the since the 90s, we have been open the economy. And today, probably, the Chilean economy is one of the, the most uh, integrated uh, all over the world. More than 70% of our GDP is a result of the uh, f foreign trade, export, import trade. And um, probably there is no other country that has this kind of rate. And that means, of course, that we are very well integrated to, to the world economy. And if you're trying to find a um, positive example where a country have had uh, good consequences of the globalization process, probably, probably the Chilean case is one of the, more, uh, the most outstanding one. Well, this um, uh, success has been observed observed by many institutions all over the world. So in, in this uh, slide, you can see the risk score ranking. That means um, certain studies that some institutions are uh, doing every year where they can to catch the um, uh, risk that this specific economy means for uh, many other countries or many other investors or even for a foreign trade. Uh, as you can see, Chile is one of the, in the highest position 
uh, all over the world after France and over Ireland, even Japan, United Kingdom, and other uh, well-developed countries. Other way of um, understanding this um, success is this um, index, the competitiveness. That is probably one of the most interesting ones. This um, index is trying to, to find, trying to show how competitive the country is. Not only the enterprises, but the country as a, as a, as a such. Um, and this is a very important concept to understand today in the globalization process, that the competition is not only between enterprises, but is also between uh, countries in this, uh, especially when you are talking of small or middle, middle uh, size countries like, like Chile. Probably in the United States case can be a little bit different. But this competitiveness index we are, we are very well located too. Look at we are immediately after Ireland, United Kingdom, Benjamin, Israel, um, before France, Czech Republic, even India. That is, is another very successful story. It's because we have uh, um, run, managed a very well the economy, very well uh, positive economic performance. Um, we have um, a business a community that's very efficient, as well as the government, and also important investment in the infrastructure that, of course, is always very important. Other institutions that publish a similar um, uh, index that we can continue. Uh, so in the next one, this one is uh, concentrated in the economic freedom. And by economic freedom, they mean how the country, uh, how the, the institution, how the um, uh, global um, uh, uh, factors that um, uh, influence the um, activities of the private sector, and uh, in this case, Chile as well has a very positive uh, rank. Uh, we are in this uh, ranking immediately after uh, United Kingdom, Switzerland, and uh, uh, with higher or better economic freedom than Netherlands, Iceland, and well, many other uh, countries. Another aspect that's extremely important today for international business is the corruption perception. And again, this has to do with the culture of each country, how the public sector, but also how the um, private uh, entrepreneurs uh, deal with the um, um, corruption. Uh, I don't think that we can say that there is no corruption at all in one country or one society. But the, the point is, how can we control this uh, corruption? How can we put the, the, the institution in a way that they can um, uh, uh, make the, that the business that you are going to do don't need to have a distortion during the, 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 the decision process. And well, again, Chile's, Chile's case is very well evaluated by this kind of institutions. We are immediately, immediately after France, United States, Belgium in, the, in this uh, uh, case. Well, in general, we are very proud of our economic development. We have done, uh, I, I think, a good job. And uh, we hope to continue to, uh, with this uh, line. But what is most important of all is the success that we had had fighting the poverty and the uh, indigence. Just 
less than 20 years ago, the Chilean society had more than 40%, 40% of poverty. That means that more than 40% of the Chilean people was, was according the international standard, uh, considered as uh, poor or indigent people. The last time that we did this study, hmm, it was uh, 2006, uh, three years ago, it showed that this index has decreased at uh, a level of 30%, more or less. Today, I think that it must be below 10%. It's still, uh, I think, too, too high. If it's 10% of poverty, I can affirm that we have probably 10% of excess of, uh, of uh, poor people. But the trend that you can observe is uh, outstanding. And uh, our ambition is to finish with the poverty in Chile in five, six, seven years more. And I think that is possible. Always we are going to have some marginal people in each society, that's true. But what I'm trying to explain is that if the society as a whole can have a responsibility for uh, its uh, members, we, we, have, we must try to do everything in order to help these people to get tools that permit, permit them to go out from their poverty. And this is the main goal that we have been fighting, we have been um, working with in my country during the last, uh, I should say, 20 years. And this is the most important success. And I, I think that this is the very unknown success of Chile. Probably um, you can read more about the economic aspect, but the social consequences are extremely important. Not only because it's a moral and ethic responsibility, but also because if you reduce the poverty, if you show that the democracy um, uh, produce concrete result for the majority of, or for all the people, that means that you are, you are going to have better demo democratic institution, and you are going to have better uh, democracy. And um, if you reduce the poverty, you have a better integrated society. If you reduce the poverty, you are going to have people that um, believe better in, uh, their, can in their country and their uh, institutions. And this is extremely important, especially when you observe that the main problem all over the world is just poverty. Well, this uh, index was published just two days ago from the United Nations that show also this trend that Chile has been increasing the quality of life. Uh, and for quality of life, we are talking of all the different aspects that um, uh, involve your own life and life of your family. Since 1990, Chile had had four democratic presidents. We have today, until March next year, uh, President Bachelet, the first woman uh, president of my country. That we are very proud of this woman. I can tell you that yesterday was published a new opinion poll in, in Chile that uh, shown that uh, our president has the support of 76% of the population. As I said yesterday, probably is a world record of, uh, in, uh, well, in all the world. Well, I can back to this with the questions. I would like just to show this um, slide that um, show us 
uh, the different uh, free trade agreements that Chile has signed and they are in implementation today. You can see that we have with all the main It's too dynamic, this, yeah. yeah. We have free trade agreement with European Union, with the United States, with Canada, Mexico, with all South America and Central America, but also with Japan and China and many other uh, countries from Asia. Uh, there are 22 free trade agreements that in, involve 56 countries today. Uh, that means over 85% of the world population. This is one of the key that explain from the economic point of view again our success. Uh, we open the economy with a very important cost, of course, very high cost, but at the same time we had the opportunity to compete with with companies, with uh, countries in different parts of the world. Uh, and this um, uh, strategy was chosen just because we understood that our own economy is too small for having the growth that we need for going out f from the under uh, development. We want to reach and we want to be a developing country in uh, five, six years. And this, this is possible. This is perfect, uh, perfectly pro uh, po possible if we continue in this direction. So probably one of the main conclusions that I can share with you that is possible to finish with poverty, that is possible to uh, eliminate the um, indigents and to have a better society, a better integrated society. And it's also possible to go from, out from the underdevelopment and to reach uh, the con a condition of a uh, developing country. Well, for doing that, you need not only economic um, uh, uh, success, you need economic success, as it's always the base for the other success, but you need also a social success and you need to have a democratic system working. In the Chilean case, we suffered a, a dictatorship during almost 70 years. And probably the most important thing that I can tell you is that we learned the lesson. We understood that the democratic system is extremely important and that the demo democracy concern everywhere. You only are aware of the importance of democracy when you lose democracy. When we lose it in 73, uh, through a coup d'etat, we understood the importance of having it. So when we recover in 1990, we decide to work together even when we have a lot of differences between left and right of different political parties, and it's, it's good that uh, we have it, and we are going to have it in the next future. But in one or two or three or very basic important things, we have to agree. And that has to do with the importance of democracy, and that, that has to do with the importance of, of having a better society, a better integrated society. Well, I would like to stop here and I open to for your questions. Thank you. Uh, His Excellency has accepted to, to take some questions. We have one roving mic, so if you'd please stand, uh, raise your hand, and if we call on you, stand and then tell us your name and what you're studying, and then you can ask your question. Are there any questions at this time? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Oh, excuse me. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. Um, my name is Jonathan Luke. I'm studying uh, history. 
uh, here at BYU. And uh, my major, my main question for you is, uh, what are the ways that the impoverished part of the community, uh, what are the ways they're being integrated into the economic success that that you've outlined? Um, are what are the what are the ways in in which they are increasingly becoming involved in the community and in the the success that you've detailed. Right. Well, um, it's very difficult to do that uh, because, um, well, I'm not going to to be a philosopher today, but for giving you a very short uh, answer. The best way of helping people go out from poverty is to create jobs. This is the, without that uh, discussion and according to our own experience, the best and the only way. But at the same time, if you only wait for a natural process of the redistribution of the of the income uh, without any support from uh, social measures, uh, I think that it's going to be impossible to reach all the population. So I think that the combination of economic growth that permit you to create jobs with the social measure that support this growth and permit you to focus the uh, many measures in order to give to the most uh, poor people um, capacitation, education, um, better housing, um, better school, better health, the ensemble of this measure permit you to uh, help the people to integrate themselves to the society. Yeah. And it's, it's not easy. <laughs> Please. Take this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Daniel Yanez. I'm from Santiago, Chile. I'm studying business management here. Uh, my question is kind of similar to the one that was asked. Uh, I remember growing up and hearing different forecasts that Chile would become a developed country by 2005, then by the bicentennial of Chile. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know, 2015 probably. So Chile has failed to reach that, uh, that condition of a developed country according to those former forecasts. What do you think has kept Chile from reaching that state so far? What has been the, the main obstacle that has kept Chile from achieving that state of of development that mm. we want to achieve? Well, many times my colleagues, economists, write and talk too much. Huh? <laughs> 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 the reality is always more complex huh? than just to write a mathematic model and try to, to find the through uh, with the this uh, with this model, no. The reality is always more complex. Many times you receive the impacts of the economic crisis, like this one, for instance, in which you have nothing to do. This present crisis is a typical one that has been created in some specific country, with in some specific sector, and that has a ramification for all the economies all over the world. Who could think, think just two, three years ago that we should uh, go through the deepness of this crisis? No one. No one. Well, so these facts are going to happen all the time. When we are working with social and economic processes, uh, it's impossible to predict them to the 100%. But on the other side, what 
I can uh, affirm is that the progress that the Chilean society has done is amazing. I don't remember exactly, but you can confirm that. But at the beginning of the 90s, the GDP per capita in Chile was not more than $3,000 per capita. Hmm? Today, the PPP, that's a purchasing, purchasing uh, per capita power, that is the main measure, measure that is used in these uh, uh, figures, for Chile's case is over $14,000. We hope to reach $20,000 uh, in four or five years, I don't know, 10 years, I don't know. And you can understand that every time that when you have reached some steps in order to reduce the poverty, in order to develop the country, the next step is always more difficult. I tell you in the poverty case, it's relatively easy to eliminate when you have 40% of poverty to go down to 30%. It's still relatively easy to go down to 20%. But then it's more and more difficult. Because just the poverty in our countries is located, the most difficult poverty is located in sectors that is more difficult to reach. You have to know where the, the, poor, uh, the poor people is living. What are their problems? And you have to identify them almost one by, by, one by one in order to reach them, for trying to help them. So I try to explain to you that some part of the development process are easier than other. And at the same time, I'm trying to say that what we have done in Chile is really outstanding. I'm very, uh, I have a big admiration for the Nordic countries. I think that, uh, of, at least of the experience that I know, are the most interesting one concerning the economic, social, and political uh, development. But I'm not sure if any of the Nordic countries have reduced the poverty in the way that Chile has done in just say, 18, 19 years. So I think that we are in the right direction. The important is to continue working in this direction. But we have a lot of problems. What I, I, I tell you is um, that uh, doesn't mean that Chile has no problem. We have problems. We have problems of, be, of being more competitive in the future, and this competitiveness is changing all the time. Mm -hmm. All the actors are very active, trying to, to find their own competitive, competitiveness in the world market. We need to have a better environment. We need to find um, uh, new energy, uh, energy sources. Mm -hmm. We can't continue with this uh, way of life, and I'm talking for all of us, that we have been implementing during the, our life. We have to change that. We have to be more conscious of uh, that the energy that we use uh, must come from sources that can, must be renew renewable. So we need to continue this uh, process in Chile and all over the world. We have also to, to have better educational system in Chile. Mm -hmm. We have done a lot, but it's not enough. So we have still many problems that we have to solve. And this is a, a big, a very interesting challenge for all of us. And I hope that also for all of you. Another question? Okay. 
No. Hi, sir. Uh, my name is Hiram Suarez. Um, I'm from Bogota, Colombia. Uh, I had the chance to live for a couple of years there in Santiago, Chile, so I could see like uh, all the good things and bad things that you have been talking about. Um, you said that <clears throat> one of the main of the or the key points of the success of Chile it's been the uh, agreements that they have signed with uh, well all around the world. Um, Specifically, <clears throat> talking about the uh, free trade with the United States, um, I think if uh, I'm not wrong, Chile was the first Latin American country to sign that uh, agreement. Um, it's been it's been like uh, yeah a couple of years. So, uh, according to your perception, how well it has done Chile after that uh, free trade, and um, also how can the other Latin American countries like uh, do better because we know like uh, United States like uh, made some mistakes about it and they uh, give up to a lot of things that Chile wanted and now uh, with the last uh, trades that United States be has been um, doing or dealing uh, it's been like more like a hard line. Uh, <coughs> process with with the Ameri la other Latin American countries so it's just like that uh, my like to be a specific uh, how well has done or how bad has done Chile after the free trade and how can the other countries uh, can improve and can better like negotiate to don't just give up everything in this trade thank you thank you very much <clears throat> and thank you for the question because uh, I can say a couple of things about our free trade agreement as a matter of fact, we finished the negotiation you know, the, between the Chilean and American government in 2003. And we have since uh, January 2004 uh, this uh, free trade agreement. A free trade agreement, the main idea is to eliminate the tariff. When you export a product from the United States, for instance, to other economy, normally the export company or export country must pay a tax that we call tariff for introducing this product or this service to the other economy, to the other country. The, a free trade agreement tried to eliminate. This is the, uh, the goal of a free trade agreement, eliminate this tariff. And we did it with the United States. We almost have no tariff at all. So we can export from Chile to the United States almost every pro product without pay paying specific tariff, and you can export from the United States to Chile in the same way. And the result of this agreement has been extremely positive. We have increased the bilateral trade by more than 300% in five years, between 2004 and 2008. And we are very happy with the result. You can see here, this is the level that we had, well, to, uh, here in January 2004, and this is the level l at the end of last year. And has been even more positive for the American export to Chile than the Chilean ex export to the United States. We had a positive balance always all the time until last year when they, the American export um, became more important than the Chilean export to the United States. But this is not the most important thing to have in this case a, a negative balance for the Chilean economy because what is important is the global balance with all over the world. And if we are getting products, services, or uh, well, different kind of um, import from the United States to, to Chile that are help us in our de uh, development. Well, it doesn't matter if we have a, a deficit in, uh, in some opportunities. So the balance that we um, we have done in this case is very positive, and probably 
is one of the most dynamic free trade agreements that we have signed. And I think that is the, uh, the same case from, from, uh, from the American uh, uh, economy uh, point of view too. Has also been very positive. So this shows that it's possible for a very small country like mine uh, to have a good um, a free trade agreement with well, the biggest and most important economy all over the world. Mm -hmm. I know that Colombia is very interested in having uh, a free trade agreement as Panama and uh, they have been negotiating during the last years. We have been supporting um, this uh, negotiation uh, and probably the best way of doing that is in one way explaining this um, uh, success story for uh, the American uh, Congress and on the other side to show that not a, a free trade agreement is not um, a, a problem for the American economy. The American enterprise can win also. Yes, right. <laughs>